Welcome back to our <clears throat> continued study in the book of Revelation. Something wrong with my voice today. I noticed a while ago I was trying to talk to somebody and couldn't hardly talk, so hopefully uh, we'll get through this <clears throat> and it won't be too bad. <clears throat> but I can't wait and do it another day because I'm getting ready to move and if I don't do it today, I won't be able to do this for several days from now. So. Uh, we're in uh, chapter six, starting in, uh, starting off in chapter six. So somebody commented to me the other night, we're finally getting to the good stuff because most people, when they talk about a study of Revelation, um, when they want to do a study in the book of Revelation, what they really mean is they want to hear about the giant bugs and the giant icebergs and the, and the giant hailstones and stuff like that. So <clears throat> the comment was made that Starting in chapter six, we're finally getting to the good stuff, and uh, I don't know what that—I don't know exactly what that means about chapters one through five. But uh, personally, you know, chapter four and five, especially five, is uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. That's the coronation of our Lord and Savior. So, uh, starting here in chapter six, uh, I probably won't make it very far. <clears throat> Made it through a couple of uh, scriptures uh, the other night, and. Uh, but if you have been sticking around, if you've made it this far and you've stuck it out this far through the, I guess the bad, the bad stuff or the not not as good stuff, but uh, if you've made it this far, waiting on the good stuff to come, then I commend you and I, I thank you for following along. So, if for all of you out there that were waiting on the good stuff to start happening, so I guess this is this is it. So, Revelation chapter six. Starting in verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. I remember we talked about the, the book and the scroll and the seals and all that in the last chapter. And he was handed the book. He was handed the authority. He was given the authority. He was. Uh, he became the Lamb, became the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And the Goal, the kinsman redeemer, became the avenger of blood. All, the, all those things happened. So now he's fixing to start opening these seals. One he opens them one by one. We've got seven seals of woe in this book, and we've got seven trumpets that follow that of things of judgments that come on the earth. And then we've got seven bowls, vials or bowls that are that the <clears throat> contain things that are going to be poured out on the earth. So we've got a series of 21 different things. That that happened. That are that is the the actual timeline of the of the of Daniel 70th week would be these seven judge the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. That's that's the timeline that goes that runs through the the last seven years. Now we have chapters like seven and eight, and twelve and thirteen. The, these chapters are, are called, they're so-called parenthetical chapters, are while these 21 different judgments are coming on the face of the earth during this time of the end days, at the same time, these other things are taking place too. The, the things that are contained in chapter 7, for instance, the 144,000 uh, Jews that are sealed, that, that's, that chapter 7 is a self-contained chapter. It's the beginning and the ending of a certain thing, chapter 12 was the beginning and the ending this story it's a it's a, a a giant overview of the nation of israel the woman and this and the the wonder of the woman in the in the sky that gives birth to the man child these things are overviews of things that are happening at the same time or while this is going on while the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls are being played out throughout the seven year period at the same time, these other things are occurring as well. So they're, they're uh, what's known as parenthetical chapters in the book of Revelation, while the timeline, the actual <clears throat> beginning to end timeline would be the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. So we start here in chapter 6, verse 1, with the first seal. He pops the first seal, the seven seals that are on the scroll of the book, or the scroll that he was handed by God the Father on the throne. And when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and, her, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, or the living creatures, the Zoe, one of the four beasts, saying, 
come and see one of the four beasts were bidden they each one of these these four introduced four separate things that happened here now the seals i saw the lamb open one of the seals it's it's erroneous to teach that we're already in the midst of the seals being popped or being opened some people teach that we've already seen the opening of the sixth seal already and that the actual the seals started being broken these 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 ones that teach us they want to put a date about about the seventh century AD is when the first <clears throat> when the first seal actually popped. So they teach it, and that's erroneous. It's it's not it's foolhardy to teach it because, like I emphasize, I hope I emphasize it clearly, and I hope I emphasize it definitively from my point of view. The fact that when Jesus Christ is crowned King of all glory, His body, the blood, the flesh of His flesh, and the blood of His blood, and His bride, which is the church, is going going to be there when our when our groom is crowned king of glory we're going to be there we're going to be with him when he becomes when the lamb becomes the lion of the tribe of judah his followers his church is going to be there to see that we're going to participate in it we're going to take place in that so i hope that it's been made clear enough that beyond i mean if if steve hess used to, again i quote steve hess he used to have a great saying that says if a man won't hear who can tell him? So, you know, there's there's going to be millions of people that defy and that go against and that think uh, wrongly and, and, and that disagree <clears throat> with what I say and others who believe along the same lines that I do about the coronation of Christ and the opening of the seals they're going to they're going to use their pet scriptures to keep on thinking that way now it would be wrong of me to say that they're absolutely wrong because when you get right down at the end of the day when it comes right down to it I've said this time and time again I don't think very few things are going to happen in the, in the going on of the end of days the way that man has perceived is going to happen and once again I, I bring forth the, the argument of the homosexual agenda because 20 years ago especially 50 years ago 100 years ago people who were prophets of the end times and teachers of the end times they could teach about everything they wanted to about the end times but before 1948 all they could do is speculate because they had no idea at what point Jerusalem at what point Israel would become a nation overnight and it just so happened to be in 1948 well before that they couldn't have foreseen that so but that didn't stop them from teaching and preaching on the end times and they taught of it up to that point and then in 1948 a lot of things became clear and then they started all these countdowns and people once once Israel became a nation oh man it was the date setting was on it was on because all these things all this conjecture all these things I remember when when um, um, that uh, people people have set dates you know of the end times and dates for the rapture and 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 they've identified there's been book after book after book identifying this certain person as the antichrist and using all this information and all these things to prove that he is this, this person is the antichrist and they're all wrong up to this point they've all been wrong so i, I don't think very few things are going to actually work out the way man predicts them to be so is it possible that everybody is wrong absolutely it's possible but when you study the scriptures when you take the script when you take the entire counsel of god paul says i have not failed to teach you the entire the whole counsel of god the entire word if you don't use pet scriptures and pet things and 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 pick and choose these cherry pick these things then then you can get a very close estimation you can get a better overview of the entirety of the things that happen so I hope that I hope that we've established as far as the people uh, that's I, I, well let me speak for me I hope that I have established and thoroughly proven my point of view as to when the rapture is going to take place and as to when this is going to happen this the coronation of Christ and that the seals I'm fully fully absolute beyond Beyond a shadow of a doubt convinced we are not in the middle of the opening of the seals it has not started yet and it will not start until after Jesus Christ is crowned King of glory of course at his coronation when he's given the scroll to start popping the seals all together so it's it's just it's erroneous to teach in my opinion it's erroneous to teach in my point from my 
perspective, my point of view, that we're in the middle of this. This hasn't began. This is still all 100% in our future, every single aspect of it. We have historical applications that can be applied to it and where they come in, where they come in. I'll try to bring them up. I'll try to bring them forward and I'll try to bring them out. As we go through here, I'm going to present varying viewpoints that aren't necessarily mine, but they are viewpoints in, in major areas across the there that some viewpoints and, and, and I, I, I try my best to bring up what I consider to be false doctrine and, and damnable doctrines and doctrines of heresy that are being taught th this day. One of which is that we're in the midst of this, that we're in the middle of it. I mean, a lot of people teach that this is a historical, that all this, that the whole entire book of Revelation has already happened and it's a historical fact and, and it's all seated and situated within the Roman Empire and the Roman rule in the days of the Roman Empire. I mean, the, there's men there's men of God consider themselves great men of God that teach that that the, the book of Revelation is is a complete is a totally history that it's over with it's done it's behind us and, and it's, nothing's coming so where I come with when something comes up that I consider a false teaching a false doctrine I'm going to present it are people going to disagree with me absolutely people disagree with me all the time and you know you're not going to hurt my feelings if you disagree with me because I'm but but I'm thoroughly convinced in my point of view and in the way I read the Bible and in the way the Lord presents it to me and that's the way I'm going to present it and if we disagree we disagree and and at the end of the day we'll all find out who's right and who's wrong and 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 I hope that it's not <clears throat> I hope that uh, uh, salvation don't hinge on some of these false viewpoints because I mean over and over and over through this book so far Jesus is saying if you have an ear pay attention to what I'm saying he said it over and over again you got to overcome to the end You've got to meet these certain qualifications. Pray to, that, you're, that you'll find yourself worthy to escape all these things. So, you know, yeah, we have to be careful. We have to take the whole counsel of God and understand all of it. And you have to be, when you present a viewpoint, when you present something like this, it is very, very, very important that you present it with the full authority within you that you're presenting the truth and, and the things that the way it is. Revelation chapter 5, we just read, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, saying, he heard these people speaking out loud, creatures, he heard creatures in the sea, creatures on the earth, he heard men in hell under the earth, he heard men on the face of the earth, every person on the face of the earth and every person that's in heaven, that's what he described, he said, heard I saying, I heard them saying this out loud. He said, I heard them saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever. This event takes place at the coronation of Jesus Christ. We studied it last time. Number one, this is the most significant event that will ever take place in the life of Jesus Christ as the eternal Son of God. This is the most significant event that will ever take place in his lifetime outside of dying on the cross because that was a sacrifice that was the only acceptable sacrifice by which man could be saved. That and him being crowned king of all glory. The two significant amount that, that, that's and, and we're not going to miss out on that. I'm making that point again. Two, if these voices can be heard by John while he is in the throne room of heaven, then the voices of men on the earth and under the earth are the voices of all the people in hell and the voices of every single animal on the earth and in the sea, speaking a language and using words, crying out worship and praise to the creator of all things, this would have been noted in history. Because if they heard it there, it would have been, if this was historical, if that was an historical event, it would be written down somewhere. Don't you think for a second that if somewhere in the age of man, the whole earth stood still and everybody on the earth cried out worship and praise and glory to him that sitteth on the throne forever and ever and ever. If every man, woman, and child just on the face of the earth had ever stopped and against their will proclaimed that out loud and the animals would speak a language where people can hear don't you think that would be written down in history don't you think on that day when that happened somebody would look around and say well, hey this needs to be written down this we don't need to ever forget this happened this is something so see what the point i'm making that's never happened yet that's still in our future that's going to happen it is absolutely going to happen because every creature that's ever lived will 
still acknowledge Jesus Christ, King of all things. Just like at the great white throne judgment, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess again. But it's going to happen before all these things start happening. That's one of the most significant things in, in heaven. So when the Lamb opened one of the seals, that's not happened yet. That's still in our future. One of the fourth beasts, one of the one of the Zoa, one of the living creatures, saying, "Come and see." As we go through the breaking of the seals, each seal is presented by a different one of the four living creatures from around the throne. In Revelation four and seven, the beasts are listed in this order. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf or an ox or a, or a bull, depending on where you read it in the Bible. And the third beast had the face as a man, and the fourth beast was as a flying eagle. That's the way they're presented in that order. Now, they're not presented in any order here. And the point I'm trying to bring out here is I don't know if that's the order in which they step forth and announce these things that are happening. Because I tried to correlate. I tried to go through and correlate. Like like here we have the first beast, the popping of the first seal. And that first seal it ends up being the white horse. And <clears throat> the first horse of the apocalypse, which is the white horse. Well, I tried, I tried to... Um, the line. I tried to go through and correlate a, a, a distinction between those two. Now we're going to get into a, a lot of a lot of study here in a minute about how, because one this is one of the biggest fallacies in the, that I found in the Book of Revelation that this first white horse, the white horse of the apocalypse, represents Jesus Christ and the last great worldwide revival, and, and that couldn't be further from the truth. So you know, the, 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 and, and I'm assuming that the line, because the first one was a line, the first one presented as a line, so this was the one that represented the lion would have stepped forth and presented the white horse which is the on which sits the lion of the tribe of Judah so I, I, I can only imagine that's one of the the uh, correlations that they made between that but as far as the other four I tried I don't think that there's any certain order <clears throat> I don't think that these these men these living these Zoe these living creatures step forth in in any particular order that that I can find anyway so verse 1, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Verse 2, and I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. That's very important. A crown was given unto him. Not only that, but what kind of crown it is. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. He went forth conquering and and to conquer. Now, start off with the horse. Several places in the Bible, horses or the imagery of horses is used and seen in conjunction with judgment, like brass, fire. These things represent judgment. Well, horses are used at certain places in, in the Bible in conjunction with judgment. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 through 18 says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, a host encompassed by the city, both with horses and with chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Well, he didn't see nothing. All he saw was when he looked at it, he saw the enemies. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. So there is an example of horses present, horses and chariots, chariot riders. All these things are in, in conjunction with, with the judgment of God. That's what Elisha was pronouncing. Judge them, judge them with blindness. Uh, again, in Jeremiah <clears throat> chapter 46. Starting in verse 6, Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt rises up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up, and I will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. 
Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield, and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall deliver, shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river of the Euphrates. Again, horses, chariots, riders, armies, all associated with the judgment of God, the judgment of Egypt. Again in cha Joel chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. He's talking about a huge, huge army. This is an army. This is Joel's a description of Joel's army as it's marching forth across the land. The vision of the army that Joel seen marching forth. And devouring the land. A, gener a fire devours before them, <clears throat> and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them. In front of them, everything looks green and lush and nice. And behind them, a desolate wilderness because they devour everything that's in their path. They eat up and they, they devour and destroy everything that they come across. Joel saying that before them is nothing but a Garden of Eden, and behind them, after they've went through is nothing but a desolate waste, a desolate wasteland. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen. So shall they run like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains. Shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble and as a strong people set in battle array. And you can imagine, try to imagine, I mean, if you've never been close to a forest fire, if you've seen one that covered on the news or seen it, I mean, the, think of the sound, think of that, the sound of destruction, that, 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 that sound, there's nothing else like it on earth, of a forest fire, a fire raging, an army moving across the land, this army, an, an army big enough to turn the Garden of Eden into a vast, desolate wasteland. Judgment, judgment is coming on the land. Judgment in the form of all these things that we're about to learn about and read about in the next few months through the book of Revelation. That's what it's about. It's the judgment of God and the wrath of the Lamb coming on the face of the earth. Don't think for a second this has ever happened in history before. The land, the land has never been devoured like that. The mountains have never been shaken and moved out of their place. All these things are going to happen. The planets have never fell out of the sky before. The, uh, these things have never happened. All these things. It, it, it has not happened. These are all in our future. And it all has to do with judgments. Just, and, and the way it starts is these four, what we refer to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's the first four things, the first four woes that come upon the face of the earth. Nahum, chapter 3, N-A-H-U-M, <clears throat> the book of Nahum. Woe to the bloody city, starting in verse 1. Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Remember, he's talking about Jerusalem. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of the slain, a great number of carcasses, and there is none end up to the carcasses. They stumble upon the carcasses. There's so many dead people laying in the streets that the horses are stomping and walking across them and the chariots are bouncing and rattling across the corpses that are laying around because the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. This is this, this is judgment. The judgment of a holy God judging an unrighteous, unholy, 
ungodly people, which is us if we're unrepentant. It's us if we're unrepentant of our sins. We're not, we're not, I'm not talking about Israel. This is, these are judgments coming on Israel. The, 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 the Jews, the Jewish people, the Israel, the nation of Israel, the rejection of God's chosen people, the rejection of God and His chosen people and, and, and His Son, Christ Jesus. That's why these things are coming. Remember, we went through the book, if you followed through the study in the book of Ezekiel, 67 times in the study of the book of Ezekiel, God said all these things are coming on the nation of Israel so that you will know that I am God. So that you will know that I am the Lord your God. That's why. That's why. It's for His namesake. Not my namesake. He didn't save me because He loved me so much. He saved me for His namesake. He didn't save anybody because He loves them more than He loves anybody else. It's for His namesake. That's why it's for whosoever will. Because it's not for an individual. There, there ain't no big eyes and little U's in the kingdom of God. It don't work that way. He will save anybody. He will save anybody, whosoever will. Anybody, all nations, all kindreds, all tongues, all people. It don't matter. Regardless, it don't matter. He will save you. For his name's sake. Not for me. Not for you. Not for any individual person. No act. Nothing. Nothing anybody has ever done made anybody good enough to be to, to receive salvation. Get that out of your head. That's the, that's, that's the main problem with the whole prosperity gospel. The whole prosperity gospel is, is rooted and seeded in the belief that I have a lot of money because Jesus loves me more than he loves the guy that's poor. The whole hyper faith thing is the same thing. The, you know, the, the instant charismatic, instant healing of everything. God demand you can stand up in God's face and demand that he heal you because he cannot lie. It's all rooted and seated in the fact that God has to love me more than he loves somebody else or he would not let me be whole and healed and allow somebody else to die with sickness. It's ridiculous, it's crazy, it's nonsense, and it's non-scriptural. God is not going to give you money or make you better than anybody else because He loves you more than He loves somebody else. But you cannot believe that. You cannot believe that's true without believing that very fact. The prosperity gospel crumbles and falls in the thought process of realizing that God doesn't give you an abundance of money because He loves you more than He loves a crack whore on the streets. Because that is absolutely not true. The gospel is for whosoever will. Period. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you have or don't have, rich people can get saved, dirt poor people can get saved, healthy people can get saved, people laying on their deathbeds can get saved. Whosoever will. And he has no favor of one over another. Drives me crazy when I hear people talk about, I've got the favor of God shining on me. Why? Why? What makes you believe? What? What is it? Check yourself. Look deep within inside of yourself, and 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 really and truly, when you're all by yourself and there's nobody to argue with except you and the Word of God, really and truly sit down and try to convince yourself that God loves you for this reason more than He loves the guy next door. Come up with a list of reasons that makes you more lovable than any other sinner that has ever been born into a world of sin where Satan rules. It's a sinful world, people. It's a sinful world and we're all sinners. 
Rich people are sinners, poor people are sinners. Healthy people are sinners, sick people are sinners. We're all sinners. And the Bible plainly tells us, number one, that the most righteous among us appear in God's eyes as filthy rags. The most righteous among us appear in God's eyes as filthy rags. He says that he don't have any favor. He tells us that he don't favor one above another. There is no favor with him. Read that. Look for it. Study it out. Find it in the Bible. Quit trying to use and usurp the power and authority that comes with the name of Jesus Christ for your personal gain. Stop doing that. Stop using the power that is within it because the, that power, that power that comes with that comes responsibility. That power comes so that you can uplift and help the body of Christ. And, and to seek out the lost and the, lo and the, the lost ones. Not for personal gain. Not for more money and bigger houses. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It, it, it's, it's not there. It, it's not there. It worked for people, but just like I said, I keep going back to this, the sheep and the goats. We cast out demons in your name. We healed the sick in your name. We did all these things in your name. And Jesus said, I don't know who you are. They didn't say we tried to do this and fail, but we tried to. We tried to give you credit, and it didn't work. That's not what they said. They said, we did this. We used your name, and it worked. And their argument is, so you have to know who we are. You have to let us into the kingdom. And what did he say? It don't matter what you did in my name. I never knew you. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. We were never intimate. I never knew you in the biblical form of knew of course he knows who they are. He knows every hair of everybody's head that's ever been born. But I never knew you. How sad and lonely and lonesome that feeling must be for them people when that, that, that day comes. We did these things in your name. We accomplished these feats in your name. We did, we, we, they're presenting themselves as religious people. They're presenting themselves as people who they thought were following the rules. They thought they were doing everything right. They thought they had it all down pat. They were secure in the fact that they did everything the right way. And when, when, it, when it comes down to where the rubber hits the road and they're looking their Savior in the eye and their Savior saying, I don't know who you are. We need to check ourselves. We need to check ourselves. God don't love me any more than He loves you. And He don't love you any more than He loves me. And that's just, and that, that applies to everybody everywhere on the face of the earth all at the same time. It don't matter where you live. If you live in a 28 bedroom house or if you live in a cardboard box on Main Street, it don't matter. God loves you the same. He loves you the same. That's it. That's all there is to it. it there's nothing beyond that. Back to the horses. I got off on that. Back to the horses. <clears throat> horses represent judgment. So we went through and we read these scriptures. The horses represent, ju represent judgment. <clears throat> and I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. A bow like a bow and arrow bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Um, some teach that this first horseman, because the horse is white, I saw him say, behold, a white horse. <clears throat> because this horse is white, that the first rider represents a one-time last chance revival for the inhabitants of the earth. And I do not hold to this theory for many, many reasons. And I'm sure that there are a great number of people who will disagree with me, but, uh, you know, just, just hear me out. Either stop watching now or, or hear me out. Number one. The opening of the first seal is just exactly that. This is the beginning of woes. Remember what Daniel said, written within it was woe. I mean, Ezekiel said written within and on the back was lamentation and woe and judgment. This is the beginning of woes. This is the beginning of the day of the Lord. This is the beginning of the judgment of God on the face of the earth. This is the first activity that represents the opening up of the judgment that's coming on the earth. The putting of his enemies under his feet the 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year tribulation period, the day of the Lord, the time of Jacob's trouble. 
whichever whichever idea you want to add uh, staple to it this is the beginning of it it's the very first thing it's the beginning of woes it is the first <clears throat> of 21 separate judgments that are coming on the earth and the earth dwellers that's known as the wrath of God the wrath of the Lamb the day of the Lord the time of Jacob's trouble the idea that there's a future worldwide revival in the last days is not scriptural. I've heard that. I've heard that preached all of my life. I've heard it preached all my life that there, that in the end days, during the end times, there's going to be a huge, huge end times, last time, last chance revival of the preaching of the cross, and that's just not that's not scriptural. There's going to be preaching to as to the converting of the Jews during the tribulation period because the tribulation, the judgment, the, the, it is all about Jews. It's all about returning Israel, the hearts of Israel to God. It's not about the salvation of the church. The Bible plainly says that the, the, the Jews are blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Well, what does that mean? We've, we've went over that time and time again. It's a mathematical number, that word fulfill, the, the fulfillment, the fullness, the, I'm sorry, the fullness. It's a mathematical number. It's, it's a number. It represents a number until the fullness, until the number until the number of the, of the Gentiles be made full. Until it comes to an end. That is the end of the gathering in of the Gentile church. That is literally what that means. That the rapture will take place at the fullness of the Gentiles. Can Gentiles be saved through the seven-year tribulation period? Yes, they can, but it is, it is going to be extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to receive salvation during the seven-year tribulation period because, number one, the first thing, you're not going to be able to buy anything. Think about that. You're not going to be able to buy anything. You're not going to be able to buy food. You're not going to be able to buy water. You're not going to be able to buy gas for a car. You're not going to be able to buy anything. If anything that is for sale that you depend on day to day, anything that's for sale, you won't be able to get your hands on it. Well, that's the reason why we should stockpile. No, that's not. You shouldn't stockpile food and water so that you can survive the seven-year tribulation period. <laughs> that's not. The, well, what you should do is do exactly what Jesus told you to do. Number one, don't worry about what you're going to eat because He's going to supply it. Don't worry about what you're going to drink because He's going to give it to you. <laughs> Don't worry about what you're going to wear because he knows that you have need of all these things. He knows that you need all these things. Don't stockpile. Don't pile up. Remember in, in manna? God didn't allow them to stockpile. They went out on, on, on the Sabbath and they gathered enough for two days. Outside of that, if they gathered more than they needed for one day, it would rot and turn to worms in their camp. God will supply your needs. Don't stockpile for anything. Have faith. And the, the fourth, the most important thing that you can do to prepare for the tribulation period is do exactly what Christ Jesus told us to do. Pray so that you may be found worthy to escape all these things that are coming on the earth. Don't prepare and get ready and stockpile to do anything through the tribulation period. The Jews are blind now, but individually they can come to the salvation of Jesus Christ. But it's difficult for them because they're under a spiritual blindness that God has put on them. He has made them blind. They are operating in a state of blindness, spiritual blindness. And it's very, very difficult for them to step away from that, although they can, because he wouldn't be righteous and holy otherwise. So when the fullness of the Gentiles has come and everything shifts from the Gentile way that we do things, which is grace, because the church don't operate in the Torah, the church don't operate in the law, the church don't keep the law, it's grace, it's the grace of Jesus Christ, unmerited, unwarranted grace. When that shifts and turns, when the time of the Gentiles is full, the fullness of the Gentiles has come, the emphasis shifts back to the Jews. The grace by which we're saved, which is the Holy Ghost, Paul says, he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That Holy Ghost, that grace, the thing that gives us grace will be taken off the face of the earth. 
So then it's necessary for God to establish a way of salvation for the Jews so that their hearts can be turned back to Him. Well, how does He do that? With 144,000 Jewish preachers that He's going to establish and seal so that they're, they're exempt from the things that are coming on the earth. They're exempt from those things so that they can preach the gospel. They can preach the gospel to the Jews because this is the time for the Jews to turn back and to accept their Savior and to turn back to God. That's what's going on here. <clears throat> I saw a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So it's the beginning of the woes. The idea that there's a future worldwide revival in the last days is not scriptural. The preaching of the gospel continues till the moment of the rapture. Then after the church and the Spirit of God is gone from the earth, which is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, which is given to the church, leaves the earth. He said it would remain with us forever. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, is a gift to the church, to the body of Christ. We'll pay close attention. John 14, 16 and 17 says, And I pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter a separate person, a separate entity, the Holy Ghost. He shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Listen to what he's saying there. The Spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive. It cannot be done. It is impossible for the world to receive the Spirit of truth. It cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Comforter of the Holy Ghost is what powers us, it leads us, it teaches us, it lives within us, it guides us, it goes with us wherever we go, and it has sealed us unto that day. It's stamped a seal right here. If you're an in born if you're if you're a reborn, born again, disciple of Christ and Christ Jesus is your Savior the Holy Ghost the third and the third part of the Trinity of the Godhead has sealed you he has marked you he has sealed you and it will keep you until that day unless you turn and walk away from it the comforter the Holy Ghost is what Second Thessalonians chapter 2 <clears throat> verses 6 through 9 and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time who might be revealed the Antichrist the son of perdition for the mystery of iniquity doth already work Paul's writing this back in his day it's already out there working it's already making plans and laying the foundation only he who now letteth will let or he who now would let that word letteth means withhold or hold back or hold things back he who now letteth will let who letteth who is the holding back who is the one that's on the face of the earth that keeps the earth from imploding on itself already who is the bible says holds the whole world in his hand who is it that the bible says that can, contains he, he contains he holds everything Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Ghost. He that now letteth, the one that withholdeth back the evil, the one that keeps the evil from completely taking over. Think about it. We've been here 6,000 years under the power of God. When God takes his power off of the face of the earth and leaves the earth that to its own will, it only takes three and a half years for Satan to completely destroy the face of the earth through wrath and judgment and, and condemnation. Because if, if everybody came to Christ Jesus during, at the beginning of the tribulation period, none of the wrath and woe would take out, would play out. Think about that. It wouldn't play out, it would end. It, it would all be over right then. But that's not the case. And it only takes three and a half years of, of, of total, absorbed rule and, and, and nothing holding evil back to completely destroy the face of the earth, completely and utterly destroy it. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way, gone, snatched up, got out of here, taken, and then shall that wicked be revealed to the world, not to us, to the world. Then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What does that mean? He's just gonna speak the word. It's all about the authority. 
It's all about the authority and the working of God's will. Satan is turned loose to do as he wants to do until God gets a belly full of it, for lack of a better term. And then he will destroy him with the power of his word, of his mouth. He'll speak the word. Be gone. Just like that. And he shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The Antichrist don't stand a chance on this in this world. He don't have a prayer. He don't have a hope. He, the, the, the Bible, listen, <laughs> this is funny. When you think about it, this is funny. The only thing that's going to happen in the end days that Satan is going to accomplish is exactly what is written in the Word of God and nothing else. Think about that, people. Think about that. Satan is running rampant over the earth, yet what he's doing, what he's accomplishing, the things that he's going to be getting done, the people that he's going to be killing, the mayhem that he's going to be bringing, the, all the evil that's going to be spread and done is his name has already been written down for 2,000 years, and he's not going to step one step beyond what the Word of God allows him to accomplish. Don't you think that's funny? I think it's funny. I think it's funny that he's that, that people people are in awe of all this power and all these things that he's going to do. Number one, we're not going to be here. The church is going to be gone. We're not going to see these things take place. But the world is going to be under a delusion. The ones that were left behind, the ones who reject Christ Jesus now and get left behind, and by that I don't mean left behind in the way like the books read, which I've never read one of them, but the people who literally get left behind and have to go through and live through and die under this reign and this regime of this guy. They're going to live in all. They're going to worship him. They're going to think he's the greatest human being. He's going to present himself. He's going to be the greatest world religious leader that has ever stepped forth since Jesus left the face of the earth. He's going to be worshipped. He's going to be lauded and heralded as, as a great warrior because he's going to make war and he's going to win. He's going to take over. He's going forth to conquer, conquering and to conquer. All these things, who can make war with him, the Bible says. But it's, it's just so hilarious to me that he's not going to ever step one step beyond what God told him he can do right here. This is it. This is his playbook. He don't have a playbook outside of this. This is all he's ever going to be allowed to do. Period. It's all he's ever going to be allowed to do. The he that leadeth that is taken away, the restraining force, the thing that keeps the evil one in check right now to the minute that restraining force is the Holy Ghost is taken away from the face of the earth. The church and the Holy Ghost go hand in hand. They go together. We're just like peas and carrots, like Forrest Gump says. We have a hard time thinking this because we have never known an earth any other way. Up until the moment the Spirit fell on the ones in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of truth, was not available to everyone on the face of the earth. And now, and all at the same time, and all of the same time, the Holy Ghost came to certain hand-picked men, the prophets such as Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. The Spirit came and spoke to or through the prophets, and then it left. That was how he operated in those days. After the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost became available to every believer on the earth as a comforter and a teacher, just like Christ had promised. His promise was that he would never leave us or forsake us. That work is performed each and every minute of our lives through the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. After the rapture of the church and the, and the simultaneous departing of the church and of the Holy Ghost that stays with the church from off of the earth, mankind and his existence will revert back to pre-Pentecost days. We'll revert back to the, pre, the days before Pentecost. We don't have that, that, that small, still voice that, that woos us and leads every man to Christ. It's going to be gone. We've never known, even in, in your sin, think about in your sinful life, in, in your sinful life before you became saved, there was always that voice, there was always that thing inside that always reminded you. You know, the Bible says that your word, His Word won't go out void, that it's always going to be there. Raise up a child in the way it should go, and He'll never depart from it. That voice that's always been there, even through our worst of times, that voice that called us back, that's, that's going to be gone from mankind. We don't know a world without that. We do not know 
a world that exists without the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost in every single life or affecting every single life. We don't know that. We don't know what, what that feels like. We have no idea spiritually what that could feel like. <clears throat> Mankind will revert back to pre-Pentecost. The Spirit of God will be gone from the earth and the preaching will revert back to the two witnesses and the 144,000 sealed Jews. The small still voice that lives inside of a man and woos him to come to the Father will be gone. Revelation 7, verse 2 through 4, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Special protection had to be granted to these 144,000 men to save them from what's coming on the face of the earth because from this point on, mercy and grace have disappeared. Remember, it's gone. The mercy and the grace, the, the, those things are gone. We'll revert back to the old ways. We'll revert back to the, to, to the pre-Pentecost days. Um, salvation at this time comes only through death. You have to die. You have to be martyred. And even death at times during these three and a half years will not bring about repentance and salvation because death is not always an option during these days. Revelation 9 and 6 says this, And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. You want to talk about zombies. You want to talk about the walking dead. You want to talk about these things that walk, these creatures that walk around that cannot die. That's going to be eerie. That's going to be strange. Men are be going to be trying to kill themselves and death flees from them. Imagine what that world's going to look like. Imagine what that's going to look like when these people who tried to shoot themselves and kill themselves and cut their cut themselves in such a way that they would that when when they tried to kill themselves and have failed because death will not find them. Imagine what that's going to look like. It's going to be awful. It's going to be worse than any TV producer, anything any TV producer can ever dream up, because this is going to be real life, reality. I've always said that all these, all these things in the world, the evils in the world, are based in, in at least some kind of, there's some kind of reality that's based with them. You know, I don't, and I don't go for all the zombie stuff and the walk. I don't watch The Walking Dead. I don't watch zombie movies. I don't go for any of it. But I know. I know because I read the Bible, I know that there's going to come a time when that's going to be a reality. That's going to be real. Men who have tried to kill themselves are going to be walking around in these cut up, blown apart, shot up states where they've tried to get, tried to die to get away from what's coming and they can't. Even when they don't want to live and face the judgment of God coming on the earth, God forces them to through not allowing them to die. That's awful. So we're going to make I'm read some scriptures, some things here to compare, because <clears throat> we know in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we know there that Christ Jesus Himself gets on a white horse, and He and all of us, all of His armies, come riding back to earth. We know that. So we're going to read those scriptures, and then we're going to compare Him in Revelation 19 to him here in Revelation 6. This white horse is in Revelation 6. So um, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. <clears throat> and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, judgment, and on his head were many crowns. He's the king of all things, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. That ought to mess up the sacred name people right there all together. All these people that run around saying that you can't use the name Jesus because it's, it's Greek for Zeus, and that when you use the word Jesus, Jesus don't hear you because he don't recognize that as his name. What are you going to do about this when it says he's got a name written that nobody knows but he himself? Don't tell me for a minute Jesus don't recognize when I'm speaking to him and I'm using the name Jesus, which is in the, the, the King James Bible. Don't, don't try to convince me that he don't know I'm talking to him because right here the Bible tells me that he's got one name that don't anybody know. 
Nobody knows it but him. Nobody on the face of the earth ever, nobody that's ever lived knows what that name is. There's only one person that's ever lived that knows that name of Jesus, and that's Jesus himself. So these secret name people, uh, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. Remember, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What makes me white and clean? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can make me worthy to sit upon one of these horses. Me and you and everybody else, nothing. Nothing I've ever done, no amount of money I've ever had, nothing that I've ever owned, nothing makes me worthy to sit on one of these horses except the blood of Jesus who died and gave that way so that he could have the authority to speak up and say, I know him. He's okay. Let him in. I know her. She's okay. Come on in. I know them. They're all right. Come on in. Uh, those, those are the words you want to hear. Those are the words that you want to hear come out of Jesus' mouth. Because that's the only thing that makes me worthy to sit on one of these horses. Following him upon him, white horses, clothing went white and clean, and out of his mouth, out of his, it's very important there, out of his mouth, Go with a sharp sword out of his. It don't say out of all their mouths. It says out of his mouth. Go with a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. This is the sword he's going to smite them with. And it's him that's going to be doing this. This is very important to recognize this fact. Because I have, it's unbelievable to me how many people I know that believe that when we all come back from heaven, that we're all going to hit the ground fighting a war. And everybody's going to run around on, our, on their horse when we get here. And we're all going to have swords and we're all going to be killing people. This is the vengeance of God, people. It's the vengeance of the Lamb. It's not the vengeance of you and me. It's not our vengeance. It's for His name's sake, not for ours. We talked about that in depth last time, I think, about, about the whole vengeance. There's comfort in vengeance, but it's His. I mean, David made it plain in Psalm 51, against you and you alone have I sinned. Nobody else. Although he took a man's wife, he got her pregnant, he had that man killed. He, and first of all, he brought him into town and tried to get him to go and lay with his wife so he could cover up his sin. And Uriah was such a righteous man, he wouldn't even go home because he wasn't going to sleep in the wife in his bed with his own wife when his soldiers that were under him were sleeping in the grass, he told David. He wasn't going to do that. So David didn't have no choice but send him back to war, and he sent him back carrying instructions, carrying his orders that ordered him to the very front line so that he would be sure and die. But then he turned around, and when he wrote Psalms 51, because of all the things he had done, that's what he said, against you and you alone have I sinned. He didn't say, I've sinned against Bathsheba. He didn't say, I've sinned against Uriah. He didn't say, I've sinned against Joab. He didn't say any of those things. It's against you and you alone. This is the day of his vengeance, folks, not ours. We're not all going to be running around with swords, cutting people's heads off. If you want to cut people's heads off with a sword, you need to join up with ISIS or Islam. That's what they do. That's what the enemies of Christ do. This is his vengeance, not ours. We're coming with him, yes, because the Bible says that we'll never be apart from him again, ever. So we're coming with him as the armies of heaven. Yes, we're coming. We're all riding on white steeds. We're all wearing white robes. We're all going to be doing this, but this is, this is his vengeance. He has a sharp sword, which represents the word of God. Because he says he's going to slay his enemy with the power of his mouth, with the power of his word. Yes, there'll be bloodshed, and they'll be stomping down. He says, I tread the winepress of the wrath of God. Yes, there's going to be bloodshed, but it, it's not for us to do. It's not ours. He will smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture, on his clothes, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is very definitely identified here in Revelation chapter 19 as Christ Jesus on a white horse returning to earth. This one in chapter 6, this, this guy is not, he's not, a, he's unidentified. 